Today, we're gonna pick back up in the book of James. I, I love the book of James. It, it is just incredibly practical. Every week, you have something that you can take with you on Monday. There's wisdom that's just so helpful in so many areas of your life. But one of the things that draws me put to the book of James is that James is the first book that was written by an apostle. Uh, James is the earliest book of the New Testament. Conservative scholars almost all agree that it was uh, the first book. We know this because James dies as a martyr in 62 AD, and he doesn't mention the biggest event of the mid-century, uh, of that first century after Christ, the Jerusalem Council, which he presided over. And he doesn't even allude to that in his letters. So most people believe that this book was written somewhere around 45 AD. Now you think about that, do the math. If Jesus is crucified between 29 and 33 AD, depending on the calendar, this means 10 to 15 years after we have a, a written record of how early Christians were being instructed to live out their faith. Now, at the time that it was written, religious leaders in Jerusalem were feeling, feeling pretty threatened by the growth of Christianity. So they began to imprison and execute Christians. And one of the first Christian martyrs was uh, uh, Stephen. Saul had agreed with putting him to death. And on that day, when Stephen was stoned, a severe per persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered. They were scattered throughout the land of Judea and Samaria. So James is writing to this group of displaced Christians who've been dispersed abroad and, and he's trying to help them deal with what they're going through and help them to be faithful to the Lord. Uh, and, and his words start out with James, we looked at this last week, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And notice who it's written to, to the 12 tribes, the, the new uh, people of God, this church who, have, who are dispersed abroad. Greetings. And then he says, consider it joy. Count it joy when you experience trials. When things are hard, count it joy. And he gives us the reason why. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Now last week we talked about how trials in your life are defining moments. They indicate what you really believe about God. They show where your trust is really at. They reveal what your faith is made of. Now, trials and suffering are no fun. I mean, we, we can't present, that, pres, present it that way. We don't consider it joy because, man, this is fun. Hit me again. We consider it joy because God is doing a work in our life. Oftentimes, trials create questions. They leave you wondering if you did something wrong. Maybe they make you start to feel that God doesn't care. They can cause doubts and questions. Hey, God, what about me? All I want is a good marriage, and, and I'm trying hard, and things are falling apart. Or, or, or everybody else is having kids who's my age. God, why can't I have kids? Or I just want to feel good and healthy so that I can serve you, Lord. But here I am stuck in this situation. Or I just want to be financially stable and have freedom so that I can give to good causes. Or I just want my mom to be well. Or I just want my parents to stay together. God, why, why is this happening? Uh, this week, I've had to wrestle with my own trials. Things that I would have never signed up for, ever. And God reminded me that he is using this hard moment to develop my character. And if I'll let him, he'll use this hardship to show his power and his beauty to the world. There have been moments that I have learned from what I'm going through. And there's been, there have been moments that I've failed miserably. Uh, I get it when you face trials. I understand. But James says in chapter 1, if you will hold on, and, and, and if you'll ask God to, to reveal to you what the purpose is, and, and you will endure these trials, he says there is reward. There's reward now where there's this blessedness of just that knowing that, that God is with you. And, and there's also this hope that if you stand the test, there's going to come a day when you'll receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. 
That's where we left off last week. So if you're new today, you're caught up. Verse 13. In verse 13, something strange happens. James transitions to the topic of temptation. Now, some people believe that James is just this random collection of bouncing from idea to idea. I don't believe that necessarily. In fact, I believe chapter uh, 1 is almost a continuous unit. And I know verse 13 goes with verses 1 through 12. I know that because look at what it says in verse 13. He says, no one undergoing a trial, one of those hardships, one of those things we talked about last week. No one undergoing a trial should say, I'm being tempted by God. Since God is not tempted by evil and he himself does not tempt anyone. Now, there's a few reasons why I believe these things are connected, our trials and temptation. Number one, everywhere in James chapter 1, you see the word trial, and everywhere in James chapter 1, you see tempted. It's always out of the same Greek word. Uh, the word is uh, parazo, and, and this can mean to test, to refine, to try, but it can also mean to tempt, to harm. In English, we just use two different words. And so, you know, usually I'll say, well, in the Greek it says, well, in the English, it's, it's really clear. These are two different things. He's talking about hardships and trials, and he's talking about temptations. Uh, but in the Greek, it, they just use the one word. So how do we know which word is right? Well, you got to pay attention to the context. The second reason I believe these are tied together. It's not just the use of parazzo through the whole chapter. It's also due to the fact that every time I've ever been put to the test, I've also been tempted. It's just the way it works. When you go through a hardship, temptations and trials always occur simultaneously. And for you note takers who are trying to figure this out, that long blank's the top one. Okay? <laughs> temptations and trials they just always happen together, right? I mean, think about that. When God is trying to build you, yeah, you're going through a hardship, your health is failing, somebody's uh, upset with you, your home is struggling. When that is happening, there's also going to be another voice that whispers into your ear that is trying to destroy you, to get you to give up, to get you to abandon God. Every trial brings temptation. And apparently the people that James is writing to, they're not all passing the test. Some of the scattered Christians were either leaving the faith or compromising their convictions. And either way, they were living a dual life. And in this book, we're going to see that some of them were slandering others. Some of them were chasing worldly possessions. Some were participating in immoral activity. Some were treating the poor brothers badly. And James calls them out. He says, hey, wait a minute. You, you, you're not confessing your sin like you should be confessing your sin. Instead, you're playing the blame game. He says in verse 13, no one undergoing a trial should say, I am being tempted. It's God's fault. Some people want to say, this is how God made me. I can't help myself. Or if God hadn't allowed this situation, or if God hadn't allowed this hardship or this person to come into my life, I would have been faithful. And in their mind, their unfaithfulness is God's fault. And you might think, oh, I would never do that. I would never blame God. Really? When you face financial difficulty, do you ever grumble about what God has given you or what you don't have? It's kind of blaming God, isn't it? Or are you always grateful and say, God, I woke up this morning and you provided the little I have, but thank you that I have it. Do you get frustrated that you don't have much and you say, well, I would give to help support the church and help support missions and help support God's work, but God hasn't given me much, even though the Bible teaches we're to tithe and the Bible teaches we're to give. Are you ever tempted to, to think if, if God really loves me, then why did my loved one die? If God was good, why did he allow this? Or you see suffering and you think if God's all powerful, why didn't he put a stop to it? That's just another version of what's going on here. There's a temptation to leave God and not be faithful, so you blame God. That's what James is addressing here in, in chapter 1. Now when this trial comes to turn your sights on God, James gives a strict imperative. Don't you dare. <laughs> Don't you dare do this. This is a strong imperative. It's just not true that it's God's fault. Don't do it. Don't say it. 
Because God is always seeking to develop your faith. He, he's never trying to destroy you. God will test people, but he has nothing to do with evil. It goes on to say, God is not tempted by evil. He himself does not tempt anyone. God is perfectly sinless. Evil is inherently foreign to him. He's aware of evil, but he's untainted by evil. God is never setting you up for failure. He's never to blame for you giving up, for you falling away, or for you getting discouraged. When we give up, it's because of our sin. Each person is tempted when he is drawn away or enticed by his own desires. We're critical of others. We sin because we're jealous in our heart of the attention they might be receiving. We're attracted to moral things because we're lured away by the lust inside of us. We, we fail to show help to those in need or to be generous with our resources because we're selfish and we live in this egocentric world. Don't blame God. L look within. You see, sin's always an inside job. It is. It's not the devil. It's not your ex-husband. It's not your kids. It's not your boss. Your sin occurs when you're lured away by your own desires. Now, Satan has a part. We're going to see that in James chapter 4. And people around you, the crowds you hang out with, oh yeah, yeah, I mean, they can persuade and they can do things, but if you sin, you have to put the bullseye on yourself and own it because it started in your heart. You wanted what was dangled in front of you. Now speaking of, uh, of this command to, to, to not blame God. Why does James start there? Because blame is our go-to, right? It's, it's what we do. When we sin, we blame. Well, the way I got treated in that divorce is, is what really made me mean and vengeful. Oh, wait a minute. I, I wouldn't have stolen or cheated unless I'd been wrong this way. James says, you, have, you may have been wronged. But all the situation did was provide the opportunity for the bad parts of you to come out. The divorce, that quarrel with that friend, the overbearing boss, those didn't make you the way you are. They just gave opportunity for the real you to come out. <laughs> that, that hardship, it just shined a spotlight on what's deep down in your heart. You see... In the heat of the moment, when our sin comes out and we let people see who we are deep down, you know what happens to us? We get embarrassed. And I don't like for people to see that part of me. Do you? You know, when you raise your voice or when you say something you regret, you're like, oh, I hate that they know that I'm like that. And so what do we do? We do what humanity has done since humanity has been on, on this earth. After Adam eats the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, in one half of a sentence, he blames two people. God, that woman you made, made me eat it. That's what we do. We blame. No one makes you mean. That's on you. No one forces you to commit adultery. That's on you. No one forces you to be critical. It's an inside job. And until you embrace that and you confess your sin and your sinful nature, it's going to control you. He, he says each person is tempted when he's drawn away or was in, he's enticed. These are two uh, images. One is a fishing image where a bait is put on a hook and that attractant makes that fish grab a hold. And the other is of like some type of, of, of bait being placed in an animal trap. And that animal looks around and makes its way in. And we who have this sinful desire inside of us see that dangling hook and we get snared and then we get trapped. And that's what sin does. It, it grabs us and it doesn't let go. Now James implies that that temptation in and of itself is not a sin. Jesus was tempted, but he wasn't a sinner. 
But the hardest reality of our existence is no one but Jesus has avoided the bait. Because of our fallen nature, all of us have this desire to sin, and we look for opportunity to sin until it conceives. Verse 15 says, Then after desire has conceived, then we see this giving birth. Sin is now a living thing uh, in, in our actions, in our thoughts, in our words. It's interesting to me that he uses a birth analogy here because sin starts so small, doesn't it? It's so little. It often seems harmless. We may think that that wayward desire, that fantasy, oh, it's not harming us. And that lust or that laziness or that gossip or that judgmentalism or that self-righteousness or that bitterness or that hatred or that racism, you think, as long as I keep it under control and nobody knows about it, everything's okay. But whether you know this or not, when you let those sinful desire or those uh, fleshly desires connect with an activity, a word, a thought, uh, and you dwell on, it starts growing in your life. And it just consumes you. And it's dangerous. Every now and then you'll hear a news story of Indiana man gets mauled by a pet tiger. You know, you read the story and you find out that this guy has a pet tiger named Cuddles, you know. And he got it when it was a little bitty, you know, cub and, and he raised it. And, and, and then one day when it's full grown, it's animal instinct took, took over and he like eats his arm off, you know, but. And the, the interviews always go the same way. They ask his neighbors, what did you think about Cuddles the tiger eating your neighbor's arm? We never saw that coming in Cuddles. He seems so kind and good. Cuddles is a predator. He has always been a predator. Sin is a predator in your life, and it might seem like a joyful pleasure at, for a season, but eventually it's going to harm you. That's what sin does. James says, when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. There's an incredibly hard word picture here. It's a picture used of stillborn. That that which we put so much hope in, that was going to deliver, when time for its birth takes place, all it does is bring grief and pain. I've walked with some families through this. It's tough. Do you know why you chase sin? Because there's something in you that thinks that it will make you feel better, look better, enjoy more, and then eventually... It brings forth death. Now, if sin brings forth death, and we're God's people, and we believe God's word, and we have the Holy Spirit in us, why do people give in to temptation? It's not because they're weaker than others. It's not because their circumstances are irresistible. It's not because the devil has your heart on speed dial. People give in to temptation because in the moment of temptation, when the hook is dangled in front of you, you think the hook looks better than God. That's why people give in to temptation. The teenage girl trades her purity because her boyfriend looks better than God to her. The man trades time with his family for the bait of accolades at work because bigger paychecks or more praise seem better than God. The lady trades in a healthy relationship with her husband for an internet romance because she wants to feel young and wanted again because that feeling seems better than God. The high of the drug or the alcohol seems better than the comfort of God. Every sin, when boiled down to its most basic form in the moment, is that object, thing, person, opportunity looks better than God. But it's a lie. That which is dangled in front of you is death in a costume. And James 1.16 says, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers or sisters. <laughs> I think these two words here 
are the hardest for me to read because I know it's possible for us to be deceived. I've wept with members who were going through hardships and I've wept with members who were bringing hardships on themselves. And it's hard to sit across from a couple and you know one of them is checking out and you're watching it. And, uh, and you know they're going to walk away. They're going to be deceived. And they're going to find themselves miserable. And I, I think to myself, how can I keep them from walking away? How can I keep them from adultery? How can I, I keep them from the harm of substances? How can I show them the danger of rebellion? And the truth is, there are some people in this room today who are singing the praises of Jesus and looking to the words of Jesus who won't be here next year because you'll be deceived. And, and you might not even make it to the end of the year because some of you are nibbling on the bait. And some of you have already taken it hook, line, and sinker and you're just living a facade right now. It always ends bad. It will end bad. In the history of humanity, every person who has gone down this path, which is all of us, have found out that death stinks. And we find ourselves hooked by it over and over again. And we did it because we thought it looked better than God. Now, at this point of the sermon, here's what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to give you three ways to handle your temptation. Okay? You know, I'm, I'm supposed to tell you to get away from the person who's tempting you. If they didn't just go to the bar, or if they didn't uh, hang out with that girl, or if they did not, uh, you know, uh, do whatever, then they get away from the source. Then I'm supposed to tell you to pray harder. You just need to pray harder and pray more. And then I'm supposed to tell some of you who are really hooked with certain things, get a sponsor who's been there before, who can help you. And all three of those things are, are, are fine advice. But here's what I want to tell you. They're Band-Aids. They're just Band-Aids. That's it. To overcome temptation, you have to believe that God is better than your, than your sin. You just have to believe it. And you're never going to get over that temptation until you believe God's better. Oh, you can, you can stay away from some places and just ignore some urges, but you'll eventually lose. You might delay your defeat, but it'll come. Or you can play the game of, I'll do better next time, God. Just give me one more shot. Get me out of this. I'll do better next time. Ah, you'll end up back at the starting gate. And even if you had the best sponsor in the world, you're, you'll get pretty good at hiding from them. You know, you can dodge them. People do. You see, until you believe that the one who gave his life for you is better and that he is worth more and that he is more satisfying than the bait on the hook, you're going to lose. The key to overcoming temptation is to believe that God is better. James picks up on this, doesn't he? Some people don't see it. They think James 17 is a clean break. But James said, don't be deceived. The devil's telling you the, hook on the, bait, uh, the, the bait on the hook is better. He said, no, 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 no. Good stuff comes from God. Every good and perfect gift is from above, and it comes down from the Father of lights. Think about God. He's perpetually, constantly, consistently good. And he is the Father of lights. The, he's the, the, or, uh, the originator of the sun, the moon, and the stars. And think about the sun and the moon and the stars. They shine with their brightness at all times. We're just shielded from it at times and we don't see it, but they're constant. That's what God's like. He shows up every time. He's constant. But then there's shadows. You know, those things that you try to catch them, but you can't, and they seem to move and they're never the same. God's just not like that. He is, he is consistently good. He never varies. His way is best. His word is true. And that's the case even in your trials. This week, I've had to remind myself of that. Because sometimes I'm like, oh, God, what's going on? I've had to remind myself, he's good. Even in your pain. Some of y'all have suffered incredible loss this year. I mean, I've walked with a few of you through some really tough things. But he's still good. Even in the hospital. Some of you are 
on a march toward lesser health, he's still good. And even at the graveside, he's good. Don't be deceived. The enemy's going to whisper in those hard moments, go another way. Don't be deceived. God is better. And if you want to overcome temptation, how you overcome temptation is focus on God and particularly focus on his son, Jesus Christ, and what he has done for you. Listen, I'm a bad driver. I admit, give me plenty of room, okay? I'm a bad driver because I have a tendency to notice everything everywhere. Like, you know, I'll see a deer at 350 yards off in the field. Hey, did y'all see that? You know, and people are like, no, we see that, you know. And, I, and I, I, I'm from the country, so people in the country have this thing that if they see somebody, you wave, you know. Like, I wave at everybody. My kids, when they were growing up, Dad, stop, you know. But you know, I just wave. I wave in the dark, true? <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, my kid's over there. She's in from Charlotte with us today, and she's, yeah, he does. But when I'm driving in downtown Atlanta or downtown Nashville, man, I don't hear that guy honking at me. I don't see that guy in the convertible with the crazy hair whose wind's blowing. I don't even notice him. I don't see people telling me I'm number one all the way down through town. I don't see that at all. You know why? I am focused. I'm going to get where I'm going. You want to overcome temptation. That's how it works. You focus on Jesus. This is how you beat it. Listen to Hebrews chapter 12. He says, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And here's that word, let us run with endurance. We're facing hard stuff. It's a hard race. Let's run this race that lies before us. And how does he tell us to do it? You keep your eyes on Jesus, who's the pioneer, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy before him, he, he, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God and is interceding for us. This works, guys. You want to beat temptation. In the moment of your temptation, you start trying to picture crucified Jesus. That'll work. Think about what he did for you. Now, if you've blown it big time, I'm not trying to beat you down. I've taken the bait before. We all have. At one time, we were all hooked and fried. Waiting to fry. But God in his love let Jesus come to take sin from us. And when Jesus died on the cross, he took the punishment for our sins. He took the death that we deserved. He allowed himself to be wrongfully accused by the religious elite. He, he, he allowed himself to be mocked by thieves, humiliated by the abuse of the soldiers and the crown of thorns. And he allowed them to nail him to a tree. And he did that to set you free from the hook and the trap. He died so that you could live, not so that you could chase death masquerading around as better than God. Now, if you're a believer, if you want to overcome temptation, start thinking about the cross. I say this all the time. Keep going back to the cross. Hey, I, I, honestly, this week's been a challenge for me. I've had to tell myself over and over, go back to the cross, go back to the cross. But when you think about Jesus dying for you and his love and the gospel, it's beautiful. And everything else doesn't matter anymore because I have him and that's enough and God is better. And if you're not a believer and you're living with this feeling of death and being trapped and guilt and no peace, there is no reason you don't come to Christ. Christ made his life death so that your death-filled life could be made alive. If you will put your faith and trust in him, he will take that guilt and he will set you free. I'd love to tell you at the end of service how you can do that. Today, after service, I'll, there'll be pastors here who are hanging around. We're going to sing another song. After service, come down and talk to us. 
Or you can fill out a QR code and say, I, I want to place my trust in Christ. We'd be glad to get with you this afternoon, tomorrow. Uh, but we want you to know the hope that we found in Christ. He is better. Infinitely better. Let me give you the takeaways. Number one. Very simple. God never pushes you to fail. Don't blame God. If you do an activity or you say words in a way that are contrary to what the Word of God says, I can guarantee you it's not because God made you that way. You just let loose what was already inside of you. Number two, Satan's going to tempt you to sin, but remember, pain and death, promise of better is a lie. Number three, following God is what brings life. It's what brings real goodness and peace and hope and joy and blessedness. And then finally, focusing on Jesus' sacrifice is how we find temptation over, uh, victory over temptation. You can find it. It's found by continuing to focus on Christ. Let's pray together. Thank you, God, for the opportunity to preach your word today. I pray, God, that in spite of the weakness of the messenger, that the message is, is clear. God, I pray, Lord, that you would help me to do the same when I'm tempted to wonder why or when I get frustrated with others. God, help me to reflect Jesus. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would move in the hearts of your people. God, help us to be people who are holy.